Hello, everyone. Um, this is the first of what we hope will be a series of uh, Go Hangouts um, with myself and other members of the Go team and Go community. Um, we asked uh, a couple of days ago uh, some people to post questions on the uh, Go Programming Language Plus page, and we got a, a really nice res response and a good list of questions. And we've invited uh, some of the people who asked those questions to join us. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Andrew Duran, and this is... Hi, I'm Brad Fitzpatrick. We both work on Go. Yeah. Um, and with us at the moment, we have um, Christoph Hack, who's one of the questioners, and he had uh, several questions. So I guess the uh, best thing is just to get straight into it. Sure. Um, do want... Christoph, do you want to ask your questions rather than us reading them out? Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> my primary interest is uh, the development of concurrent systems. And yeah, I, I especially, especially like the changes from Dimitri. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would like to see more concurrent data structures. So what, what kind of um, concurrent data structures? Yeah, for example, there's a change set from Dimitri which introduces a swing point counter. And yeah, I would like to know what's happened to this CL, for example. I think that one came pretty late, um, right before Go1 came out. So I think, I think that one was just held until things settled down. I don't think it was shot down or anything, was it? No, it was really just um, too late to be adding to the API at that stage. I think it was only in like January or February that it, that it was sent in. And it w was that one of the ones that you could do as a normal package, or did it require any changes to uh, the runtime? It requires changes to the runtime because it holds uh, some variables into, uh, stored in the OS thread as a... Mm. <laughs> OK, yeah, I imagine a lot of these ones that came really late towards the end of Go1 will be discussed again. But right now, we're just kind of relaxing and letting people use the language and trying to not change things a lot. So. Yeah, I mean, for the past couple of years, we've been adding things at a kind of furious pace. And um, now it's kind of a time to sit back and play with what we've got. So I think there'll be a time to reconsider stuff like that, but it pro probably won't be for, for a while. That said, Dimitri is still going crazy working on Go internals. So um, yeah, he's he, he he hasn't gone away. He's he's still quite busy. Uh, but do you think there will be one day where Go gets a good package with a lot of concurrent stuff like java.utils.concurrent, for example? I think that if there's a if there's a need for it, if like people in the community see a need for it, it will be difficult to to resist. Um, Particularly because it's an open source language and people can just patch in their own runtimes and stuff if, they, if that's what they really want to do. I don't imagine we'll get like a gigantic package of every concurrent data structure, but hopefully we have the right atomic primitives that other people could publish their own, like, you know, concurrent maps and all that sort of stuff um, on GitHub, you know, just using the atomic package and go. At least we'll hopefully get there. If if we don't already have, I mean, the atomic package right now already has a fair bit of stuff, so I'm not I'm not sure exactly what's missing. You mentioned sync dot counter, and I don't know what else. So another one of your questions, Christoph, was about become a, a become statement. Uh, exactly yes. Yeah. Um. So it's something that you know is kind of interesting. Um. It would be interesting to see how that sort of fit into the language, but I think it's unlikely we'll be making language changes for Go 1.1. I think if we introduce a become, it would be more like at least a year away. Um, you know, language changes tend to have a pretty transformative effect on the way we use the language, even though become is kind of simple concept. Um, its ramifications could be pretty profound. So um, I think it'll be a while before we actually look at that properly. Similar answer to the previous one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Awesome. It was fun while it lasted. Yeah. 
Um, so the the next question you had was about um, experimenting with other GC implementations, garbage garbage collection implementations. Um, and so right now we do have um, improvements being made to the existing garbage collector. Um, there's a set of changes being pushed through by um, Dimitri, who's uh, which is has a view of um, parallelizing and speeding up the garbage collector. But then there's also um, some pending changes from another contributor that uh, will make the garbage collector more precise um, and sort of hopefully eradicate some of the issues we've been seeing on 386 systems um, with imprecise garbage collection. Um, but as far as uh, redesigning the GC, it's something that's been on the table for a long time, um, but it, you know, it's one of those sizable projects yeah. that it's a matter of just having the time. I think somebody else asked somewhere about whether mm -hmm. we'd have a compacting GC. And I'm not sure that is even relevant nowadays with gigantic address spaces on 64-bit machines. I mean, it's, it's certainly not as important as it used to be. Yeah, I think it would be very hard to put a compacting GC into Go anyway, because the, the references or pointers are not really that transparent the way they are in a language like Java. Uh, Andrew, why is there only just one article on the Go blog this year? Oh yeah, that was Christoph's final question. So I take full responsibility for the uh, the dearth of, of articles on the Go, Go blog this year. Um, we do have a number of them in the pipeline, so that should be picking up in the very near future. Um, but yeah, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I might just go back to the top and start answering some of the questions that people sent in. Um, so a big one that got lots of plus ones was, uh, are there plans for Android support in Go? And Brad used to work on Android. Yeah, so, so prior to working on the Go team, I worked on Android for a couple of years. And, um, I actually used Go a fair bit to um, do like performance and debugging stuff, but I would just you know compile a binary for for ARM and just ADB push it to Android and just run it there because there were no scripting languages on the phone and there were no uh, you know there was no good shell and you know the, even the C library was pretty small, so I would just you know do debugging like that. So that's one you know meaning of Go on Android, but I think most people want to be able to write GUI apps and put them on the market. And the best way to do that portably is to call into the existing C APIs that, uh, that Android provides. But those are generally for like full screen games and stuff. And until about a week ago, we couldn't link with uh, C libraries on ARM. Uh, but that now works on like Panda boards and stuff, but I'm not sure it works with the, uh, the Android C libraries yet. So, but even once we had that, then we still wouldn't be able to call into the um, the Java GUI framework on uh, on Android, De calling all the um, you know Java APIs that you know make buttons and widgets. We'd only be able to do like full screen games. So I don't know. Th I don't think anyone's uh, working on it. I think if anyone wanted to, wanted to play around, the best route would be to uh, run like a Go as a child process underneath Dolbic and then communicate between the two to uh, kind of like run all your logic. In, uh, in all, you know, in the ch Go child process, and then have the uh, parent Dolvik process do all the, um, you know, calling into the activity manager and window manager and all that sort of stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly not working on it. But it would be fun if someone did that. Yeah, I mean, even if it it, it is possible, it's just a sizable amount of work to actually get it going. Yeah. Actually, this sort of leads into a, a later question we had about. Um, uh, GUIs and and uh, widget toolkits. Where was it? Yeah. So, are there any existing libraries or a Go specific system for building GUIs? Um, and so, there are like a lot of uh, wrapper libraries for things like GTK and um, and other uh, like cross platform toolkits and um, graphics toolkits. Um, but the most exciting one that I saw recently is um, John Asmuth has been writing. Um, there's a package called Go WDE, which is uh, like a windowing environment that can open a native window on Windows and OS X and X. And so that's like a cross-platform way of actually drawing to the screen. Um, they also added what keyboard and mouse handling and stuff to it. And yeah. And then on top of that, he has a thing called UIK, which is a, 
uh, Go UI kit, which is still in early days. Um, but it, it uh, for my limited playing with it, it has a pretty nice um, API that uses a lot of Go's concurrency features, so you receive events on channels and things like that. Um, and it looks like a pretty nice way to, to start writing um, graphic stuff. So I'm, pre I'm pretty excited by that. I knew it was only a matter of time before somebody started writing an idiomatic UI toolkit for Go. Um, but I think that GUIs are one of the sort of toughest things in terms of the amount of code that you write um, to put together. So it'll be a little while before it's really mature, I think. Uh, is there any support for developing native client programs with Go? Um, and so the answer is that there used to be, uh, but uh, there was a bit of churn in the way um, native client worked, and it was becoming difficult for us to keep up with, um, with native client, and so we sort of backed off on supporting it for a while. Um, but the, the direction that native client is taking now is using um, uh, intermediate format, an LLVM, yep. Intermediate yeah, format. going to Bitcode. So they're calling that one Portable Knuckle or Pinnacle. And I think, I, I mean, the impression I get is that Chrome right now supports Pinnacle but only for web store apps and for only for x86 but not for the whole web. And I think it won't be enabled until Pinnacle is ready. And then the browser will, like, convert the uh, LLVM bitcode to one of the other three um, native client variants, whether that's 32-bit, 64-bit, x86, or ARM. And so that means Go would have to generate um, basically all the embed code, which we don't really have a good story for. No, uh, well, so the GCC Go front end, Go front end, um, was designed by Ian to be sp uh, specifically to be uh, independent of GCC. So in theory, um, it should be possible to reuse a lot of that work. Yeah. Um, on LLVM, but I don't know if there's split stack support in LLVM. Or and the garbage collector story on uh, LLVM, I've also heard concerns about. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of unanswered questions there. Yeah. Um, it would be a great thing to have, but... It seems like one of those things, like, combining GCC's Dragon Egg with, you know, the Go front end and GCC, like, you know, <laughs> maybe you can kind of jerry-rig it all together, but uh, nobody's done it. Yeah, we were actually discussing maybe a faster path to getting Go running in a web browser would be to use... Um, what is it, Fabrice Bellard's yeah. JavaScript x86 emulator. Yeah, we, we tried that. We tried uh, building a, uh, a 386 binary and UU encoding it and pushing it to that JavaScript on uh, Linux JavaScript thing, and it died with illegal instruction, and we didn't get... <laughs> we, yeah. didn't, we didn't debug enough to figure out what instruction JavaScript was failing on an x86. But, I mean, that's, that was, that's pretty interesting. I mean, it's pretty fast for what it is. Yeah. Um, but probably not fast enough to make it actually worth using. <laughs> um, uh, Senka had a question about speedy support in Golang. Um, oh yeah, so we we had a speedy support in the standard library, but uh, we moved it to experimental at the last minute before Go One because it, just like WebSockets, it's one of those things that. Uh, is not quite stable yet. The community keeps changing the spec, and we didn't want to lock it into Go One. Is it on there? Is, and, uh, it, in, is it in experimental? Or did we put it in Go Net? The I think it's uh, I think it's an exp. I'm gonna show there. But yeah, so uh, we have it, but it's not wired up to the HTTP package. Other people have done that to varying uh, degrees, but apparently it's compliant enough to um, some people on the Chrome team were using it actually as a uh, compliance test suite for uh, other vendors and other uh, other browsers to test their speedy implementation. So I guess I guess it's pretty com uh, complete, but it's just not a uh, speedy as not locked down, and we haven't wired it up to the Go HTTP package yet, but that shouldn't be too much work. Yeah, it actually is in the Go Net sub-repository. So it, oh, it's moved there now. Yeah, so it should be fairly easy to, to bring in um, yeah. to when you go out, just the same way you would with WebSockets. And I think you might actually be able to make a a custom net.listener interface, or an implementation of the net listener interface mm. with a custom netcon, and then you pass that listener to the Go HTTP server, and once you get the NPN uh, negotiation that says, I support speedy, I think you could just run your own event loop and call into the existing Go HTTP server with these fake connections. Mm. So I think you might be able to do it without any changes to the Go HTTP package at all. Mm. But uh, I haven't tried that yet. Yeah. 
it would be nice if we didn't have to, particularly on the API side. Uh, this guy also had questions. Um, uh, it's too much for me to decode right now. <laughs> um, Alexander Serma was asking about uh, how you lay out a project which is not pure Go to work well with the Go tool. So this is actually pretty interesting because Camly Store, um, the project that Brad's putting a kind of addressable storage system, is not just a Go endeavor. Yeah, but it's mostly Go. It's mostly <laughs> Go, but it has non-Go pieces in it. Yeah. It, well, it used to be the uh, case that I had my own builds. Hey, we have a new one. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure thing. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. I'm on a uh, mobile phone, so the connection is not great. Um, Seems great. Oh, awesome. Uh, my name is Alexander Engling. I live in Sweden, in Stockholm. I've uh, been doing some... I had a question, actually. Sure. Uh, posted on the thread about... One was on Android, which seemed to be a popular question. Um, and the other was about safety critical uh, real time programming. Yeah. So um, we just I talked. A, I'm sorry. We, go ahead. Uh, we just talked quite a bit about um, Android, but right. if you can, if so, uh, you can watch that on the recording. But do you want to just tell us more about what you want to know about the safety stuff? Well, I was thinking. Basically, I did a before I. I'm currently doing a PhD here at. Um, in Stockholm at the Royal Institute of Technology here. Uh, before then, I uh, worked in England on uh, basically um, some work on uh, un unmanned aerial vehicles, which we wanted to certify to a civilian standard. So there's a, a DO178B standard, a safety critical standard. Um, and basically, um, that, the work was either done in C or in ADA. Basically, there's a company called um, BAE Systems that mostly focuses on ADA and the other uh, companies you see. Um, to, uh, I've loved C. I've been programming for quite a while. But with Go, I must say that's... I, I love the comment that Go is... Um, Go is the next C from the people who didn't give us C++. <laughs> Uh, so that for me that was a, it was a very nice language to uh, to, to work in. So um, thank you so much for giving us that. Uh, but I would be very interested in the possibility of of, of programming hard safety critical real time in C. Uh, sorry, in in Go. But um, the garbage collector is an issue, of course. That won't work. So I was just wondering whether you um, had thought about. Um, Possibly turning that off and letting us have other mechanism for doing hard time, hard real time development. Uh, I mean, it's certainly not a goal of the project. I mean, if you can go in and hack it up to turn it off yourself, but um, then you're on your own. Yeah, I mean, so it's not really a recommend. Yeah. I, I mean, it might it might just not be a good fit um, because the language was designed to be garbage collected and. The, yeah, exactly. To make a really nice language that has like manual memory management and the kind of tools you need to do that, you probably need to go into it from day one with a different sort of attitude. Mm. Um, so it you know, it's, makes sense. I mean, if you really wanted to use Go for some part, you'd probably have to do what a lot of people do and do a hybrid system where some yeah. real-time system does the important safety critical stuff, and you leave Go on the side to do like high-level planning. But I mean, yeah. but you know, I could be wrong. It, I don't know enough about it. It's possible that some real-time guru could come in and just put in the right things and make a real-time go. I, I mean, I think I've seen companies who sell real-time garbage collected, you know, uh, VMs, but uh, certainly not in our roadmap. Yeah. Right. I, I was just wondering. It's, uh, it's interesting uh, to hear your thoughts on it in case somebody's kind of thought about it. All right. But thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. They're up. Any other questions? Um, one thing is, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no please. Okay, uh, sorry, turn to the uh, other guy here. Um, I briefly asked about, and I'm sure you guys probably won't answer this, but any any indication on when the uh, Go real-time, as 
to go um, on App Engine will be out of experimentation mode would be interesting. I have a few projects, uh, a few companies that I'm working with which has implementations in Java and uh, it's hard right now to justify switching to Go as long as it's in experimentation mode. So I was just wondering whether you had any insight about that. We're, we're actually, um, we're reasonably close. I can't give any kind of time frame because no, I mm, it's, it's not our policy to do that. But um, yeah, it's something that we're heading towards and we're, you know, the, the wheels are in motion to make that happen. I think happen. one of the big requirements was that the language be stable. Yeah. And we, you know, stop pushing updates every couple of weeks. But now that Go One is out, I think that's just a matter of uh, proving to the App Engine team that um, we really are stable and we really aren't going to change it every couple of months. Nice, yeah, very nice. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I have an, sorry, yeah. I have another uh, garbage collector related question. And uh, how hard was it? Was it for the WIT test team? you know, the, the guys who implemented the highly scalable MySQL frontend uh, to deal with the garbage collector. I think they run across a couple of bugs. Yeah, they've been, they've been pushing it pretty hard. Um, they've been, um, you know, tweaking things and playing out with Dimitri's patches. And they've also found, though, that if you have um, just large byte slices and you do your own buffer management, um, you don't put pressure on the GC. And I, I found the same thing. I've been... Um, I rewrote uh, Memcache. So I, I'm the original author of uh, Memcache D, and so I decided to rewrite that in Go uh, recently. And the naive thing to do would have every item in Memcache just be its own Go object, and to do all the LRUs with pointers, and to just you know let the GC take care of uh, cleaning stuff. But I knew that would be pretty stressful in the GC, following all those pointers and you know dealing with all those small objects and having a fragmentation of the heap. So I just basically ported the C version, which has its own slabs of, like, big one meg uh, slabs of memory and cut up into different sizes and has its own, you know, uh, internal pointers that aren't actually Go pointers but are just references. And uh, it does pretty well. It uh, There's not much GC activity. Once it gets up to the size, uh, you know, it does these one meg allocations up to, like, you know, four gig or whatever it's at, and then it uh, it stays pretty steady. So if you if you... Keep most of your memory in like big uh, byte slice buffers. Uh, the Go garbage collector won't walk those. It won't look them, you know, won't scan them looking for pointers because it knows that they're just bytes. So I think Vitesse uh, does a lot of those tricks as well. Yeah, I mean they they did um, those the YouTube guys for a long time have been um, using Go, and they've been really great at finding um, performance issues. In the runtime, the garbage collector. I think they found some libraries. escape analysis bugs too. Yeah, they're yeah, they're great, and they're they're really uh, data driven. They do a lot of uh, load testing and give us a lot of good data. So that's it's cool having them hacking on Go stuff. Should we yeah. return to the list? Do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, so another, there were another question was about uh, dead code elimination, um, and they was uh, this is Igor, and he was saying that if you ship a simple web crawler, you end up with an executable that's about three meg. Sounds uh, good to me. Yeah, that actually like that is pretty small um, for a modern piece of software. Um, it probably could be smaller if you could strip out all of the um, debug symbols and reflection type annotations. Um, and also, but uh, I think a, a big part of the issue people have with the size of Go binaries is a lack of perspective. I mean, if you statically uh, link a Hello World C program against libc, it's at least 700, 750k. Especially once you include uh, all of ICU and all the Unicode tables. So yeah. people don't realize that you know they import uh, the thumped package and the thumped dot you know printf Hello World. What they're also pulling in there is, you know, all the Unicode tables and uh, everything that's in Pumped. And, you know, you might argue that, oh, well, you don't need it just for the ASCII string Hello World. But um, any program that does anything halfway interesting all of a sudden starts, you know, you know, dealing with Unicode and dealing with, you know, those case things. So Yeah, I mean, in the, even a simple Hello World program, the amount of uh, mechanism there is in there to do interesting things um, is, uh. is pretty huge. But 
the um, what people don't realize is that if you say fumped print something, it's only at runtime that um, the program knows which code path it's going to actually use. So it's very difficult to do static um, code elimination of, say, Unicode stuff if you didn't print any Unicode. Before the program runs, it doesn't know it's not going to print any Unicode. So I'm actually, one of the things that drew me to Go originally was that it was so easy to deploy. I would, you know, compile it and I would get the static binary that didn't even use libc and I knew that, like, I could just copy that binary around in my servers and it would just work. I wouldn't, it didn't matter what version of libc or, like, zlib or, um, you know, random, I don't know. There, it, there was no versioning problem because I just had this binary that worked. Mm. And so I don't care if it's 3 meg or 100 meg um, compared to the size of my hard drives. It's this is easily deployable binary, and even my biggest project, I think, makes a 24 meg binary, um, and that is a ton of code. So mm. I, I think that's awesome. Yeah, and like for example, um, I recently gave a talk at Tumblr in New York, and just before the talk, I was told that I needed to use a computer that wasn't mine. And if I'd been about to present in another language, which required me to you know, have an elaborate setup to install various libraries and all that kind of stuff, because it's all dynamically linked, I would have panicked, but instead I just SCP'd all my binaries over to the new machine and just ran them, and it was not an issue. It just worked perfectly. Um, it's cool. So, you know, there's, there are benefits too. Cam twist die. Oh, uh, we're back. You're back. Welcome back. Yeah, what, welcome was the, back. What, what was the last thing you heard me say? <laughs> You're talking about Tumblr. Can Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Computers. Yeah, computers are awesome. Um, Igor also asked about. Um, uh, SDK for Windows. Oh, no, on the same topic, he was saying, he was asking about uh, the amount of virtual memory that Go programs use, and it's true. I mean, the way uh, Go's memory management works is that it just allocates a huge chunk of virtual memory at startup. Um, but the thing is, virtual memory is just that. It's virtual. It doesn't actually cost yeah. anything. So um, Igor was saying that his clients freak out about the size of allocated virtual memory, um, I guess they should just relax. I think you'll probably see more people start to like do these tricks. I mean, it's basically a trick because we have tons of uh, virtual address space on 64-bit machines especially. So you can play tricks with uh, encoding information into your, uh, into your pointers about, like, say, what size it is, um, which isn't as feasible on 32-bit. Um, on mm. So... Maybe, I don't know. I think once all these um, virtual hosting container things, um, you know, fix their bugs where they were limiting on virtual memory rather than real memory, mm. um, I think people will care less. Or maybe it's an issue of top, you know, yeah. showing showing the right things by default instead. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of people don't even understand what that column means versus the like. There are there are too many columns. Though. Yeah, there are too many columns. Uh, yeah, Igor also asked about uh, App Engine and about the App Engine SDK for Windows, um, which... I think we're getting closer. We're, we're getting closer. We're working on it. We actually have the Windows people on App Engine yeah, uh, uh, working on it. Dave Simons, who uh, does a lot of that stuff, um, he recently rewrote the SDK build script entirely in Go so we can run that now on Windows. And so he ran it there, and it got close. Yeah. Um, get some problems, but we're definitely closer than we were uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, I apologize to our Windows users who really want to use Go and App Engine. My dad, um, my dad is one of them. He, uh, he was trying to write a silly little uh, web server to like scrape the weather for uh, the beach or something, <laughs> and uh, he was going to use Go and he was going to use App Engine, and of course, you know, he has Windows, so 
he was yelling at me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll yell at somebody else, and I yelled at Dave. <laughs> and things happen. So yeah. if it, it's, you know, it's improving. Um, another question that Ego asked about App Engine is whether the app is distributed broadly, uh, like in, in terms of uh, when a Go app starts, um, if it needs to load stuff from local disk, like template files or so on, um, should they be concerned? Um, should they dip them up or um, incl uh, compile them into the Go program? Um, I think uh, the answer is probably not to worry about it unless you experience issues with it. Um, I know that uh, in the case of the Go doc server that we deployed to serve golang.org, we actually um, zip the entire uh, Go tree up into a zip file and serve out of the zip file um, using a zip file system implementation. Um, but that was really because it, would, it was taking us too long to upload the several thousand files. But I think we heard the other day somebody was saying that they fixed that or they're, yeah. they're redoing the uploader to um, deal with lots of files better. So yeah. that may not be necessary sometime soon here. Yeah, and I, I understand that there's also work underway to make reading from disks in, a, in an app, app package um, faster as well. But I'd be curious to hear if, um, if anybody actually is having issues with uh, startup time because of reading stuff from, from local disk. Um, he also said, I really miss NDB-like frameworks and app stats, question mark. And I don't know what either of those mean. NDB is the, um, the new, simpler, uh, closer to one-to-one -one API for Python to do data storage stuff. Uh -huh. And so um, Python, when the Python app engine, when it first came out, had this really magical data store interface that um, it was hard to reason about the performance because it was doing all these, it was doing all these database lookups behind the scenes um, I remember being really scared of it because I could never tell what it was doing and I couldn't make anything go fast. And then I looked at the uh, the Go one for the first time and I was like, oh, I understand this one because you know it's very simple, small primitives and every one of the operations actually did an API call or did disk scans or did disk lookups. And in meanwhile, the Python people have done kind of the same thing with NDB. Mm -hmm. What was the other reference? Apps, oh, AppStats is, um, that's the thing that monitors all your RPC calls. From, oh, right, from right. untrusted code to the uh, API host and tells you, you know, you did this many data store and this many memcache and you were blocking your code for this long. That's actually um, really awesome. Yeah, we can actually do that pretty easily. Or actually, you might even be able to do that in um, in Go really easily by just wrapping the app engine context object and wrapping call and um, just forwarding all the call calls to the other one with, with some timing, you know, stamps before and afterwards. Mm. So... Yeah, I, I think AppStat should be trivial and go without even support from uh, us. So somebody do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more questions. So Paul Coyle wanted to hear about uh, concrete examples related to testing code that uses channels and testing with respect to Go routines in general. Yeah, I mean, so I have a lot of code that uses channels and Go routines, and I find it quite testable. Um, you can do things like, if you need to make us, if you want to like test a race condition between like Go routines and locking, you could always insert like a, a dummy variable in your package that's, you know, lowercase, and it's just called like, you know, pause here, blah, blah, and it's a variable, um, but of type func, you know, some nilatic func. And in your code path where you want to like catch a race, you call it, which does nothing in reality. But then in your test code, you uh, you change that variable to like wait on a channel, and then you could like send a channel to that code. So you could force that code to block until you want the code to proceed. So I can um, I can force my code to race in every which way. Um, I don't know. I actually find testing in Go the easiest of any language I've worked on. Um, with channels, I mean, testing code that uses channels is great. You give it the channel, and you send it the values and read the expected values. Um, I don't know what's hard about that part. Mm. There's an interesting thread um, on Go Nuts uh, recently started by Pitar Memunkov about um, sort of black box testing of uh, software that uses Go routines and channels, oh, yeah. um, but tr that, that has some real-time properties. Oh, uh, he cared about... Um, Taking time yeah, as well, and yeah. so you can you know inject your own clock 
and stuff and don't use you know time.now or time.sleep have your own um, kind of time interface that has things like sleep and yeah yeah that's it's an interesting thread and there's some code in it too so worth checking out uh, next question so this, I don't know I don't know if I'll be able to answer this but the Sego uh, this is a Sego question from Wilson, which is, what's the recommended or safest way to invoke a Go function from a C callback running on a different thread? I think you can only call a Go function from from C if that C function was originally called from Go. Yeah, I don't know true. if it's asking something else. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, that's that is the recommended and only way, and that way is safe. Yeah, and I think so. when you call into um, Sego, it locks the thread that you're on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, it, it, yeah, that's it. There's, I mean, there's uh, examples in the uh, Go source tree about how to do this. It's in um, Sego testing callback.go and callback.c that shows examples of this, so you can look there. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's it's about quarter to ten now, so I think we've... We started about 10 past, so we should probably wrap things up. Cool. Um, thanks for joining us, um, Christoph and Alexandra. Do either of you have any uh, quick questions before we go? Not off the top of my mind. Uh, thank you so much for uh, hanging out, and uh, thank you so much for the language. The pleasure to use. Cool. No problem. See you next time. See ya.